Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. Dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, and welcome to this Raising Believers special session. And as you can see, I've got with me uh, Brother Shu'aib Muhammad. And without further ado, let's begin. So, Brother Shu'aib, um, I, I would love it if you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the sort of work you've been involved with, with um, Dadhood, the podcast and your coaching work. And then um, we'd love to hear your thoughts about fatherhood and some of the ideas that you'd like to share with us today. Allah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, jazakallah khair uh, to you, Ustada Fatima, uh, for inviting me on to uh, to to speak to your fellow students um and had a we we've run this session before in a previous cohort and it was very enjoyable alhamdulillah so i'm glad that i'm able to come back and uh, give some more value inshallah to um some of some of the uh, the people in this cohort um myself you know funny enough um your team who reached out to me they were kind of putting together a bit of an introduction for myself and they did a way better job of introducing myself than I could have done introducing myself so that that was uh you know I need to save that one because it was it was written very nicely mashallah. mashallah um but if I had to kind of uh tell people a little bit about myself uh, I'm a father um of two children alhamdulillah uh they're quite young at the moment um a few years ago back in 2020 I started off the dadhood podcast um and that was you know in order to sort of engage uh, fathers in conversations around being a Muslim father. Um, and then, you know, since then, alhamdulillah, it's grown and I've had a lot of fathers reaching out to me and I've been coaching some fathers um, on time management um, and uh, mainly on time management and a few other things um, just to ensure that fathers are still living up to the standards that they promised they would do when they got married. You know, sometimes those goals uh, get put to the side. Um, and other than this, you know, I, I work for Muslim Kids TV. Uh, which is a streaming uh, platform for Muslim children, a kind of halal Netflix. Um, yeah, that's about it. I think that's everything I'm doing right now. Jazakallah khairan, uh, Brother Muhammad. Please uh, tell us uh, what your session is going to be about and please do begin. Okay, inshallah. So let me um, make sure I am going to be sharing my screen properly and I'll ask you if you can see it. Okay. So after Brother Shaib's uh, uh, presentation, you're going to have the opportunity to ask questions. So please do have your questions prepared and we'll be open to you uh, unmuting yourself and, you know, asking the questions verbally yourself. So just just for you to know that you're going to have that opportunity, inshallah. Inshallah, So we'll get started. So this session, in terms of what we're going to be covering, uh, will be the following. So first of all, we're going to go through what um, an involved father is uh, from the perspective of the Qur'an. Uh, secondly, we're going to go into what are some of the negative effects um, that that an absent father can have on child development. Uh, then thirdly, practical tips on spending some time with their children. Have 11 tips, inshallah, uh, that all of them should take less than 10 minutes to do to build that quality time. And then number four, I'll just let you guys know a little bit more about dadhood and where you can find some of that information. Um, so yeah, the real focus is on the first three. So let's get started. Uh, this is the first example I want to bring, which is the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam and Ismail alayhi salam. So we have in Surah Al-Safat, uh, this exchange between this father and this son. And it's a very, very powerful exchange and we can draw many, many benefits from it, from the angle of how powerful it is uh, for a child that they have a father that is really involved in their life. So the first thing we see here is um, when the boy reached the age to work with him, okay, 
uh, this is the start of this ayah. So this is when Allah is talking about it, putting this story into context that when Ismail Ismail reached that age of puberty, reached the age of you know being a young man, being a teenager, or maybe slightly older than that, uh, being you know in an age where he is able to think for himself, he's able to do for himself. Uh, it is at this age now where Ibrahim is bringing this question to his son. So Allah SWT kind of contextualizes this and tells us that we're going to be seeing how Ibrahim as the father interacts with a teenager or interacts with a young man um, and his son being at that age. And then we go on to see how does the father actually interact? He, remember his son is of this age where he's able to do for himself and think for himself. And the way that uh, Ibrahim salam, starts in, in his interaction says, uh, Ya Bunay, oh my dear son. So he addresses him with the most uh, endearing way of speaking to his son. So uh, here we see an example that what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to teach us is how we as fathers can speak to our children, you know, speak to them with endearing words, speak to them in a way in which they feel like they're close to us. And this is even even though that the son is a bit older now, sometimes we speak in very sweet ways to our young children. But when it comes to the olders and the ones who are teenagers or above, they become adults now, they, they, they're doing their own jobs and whatnot, they're working for themselves. We maybe we've lost those sweet words with them and we speak to them as if, you know, they're, they're adults like us. And of course they are. But here Allah SWT is reminding us of using those kind of sweet words and saying, oh, my dear son. So already we've got kind of two things. One is Allah setting up the context that Ismail is a teenager. Second thing we see here is that Ibrahim is using the kind words to engage his son. Then what is this all about? This is about, of course, the famous story where Ibrahim says that Allah has told me in this dream that I must sacrifice you. And how does Ibrahim end his uh his sort of uh his request to his son he says tell me what you think huh? so he said ma ma da tara. tell me what do you think about this so this is again another interesting point that Allah brings he is he's telling us through this story to essentially engage your child with your decisions engage your child with these conversations um and bring your child into big decisions that you are making and remember, if we go back to the context, Ibrahim is somebody that is already a young man. He's somebody who thinks for himself and does for himself. Sorry, Ismail he's at an age where he thinks for himself and does for himself. And it is at that age where Ibrahim says, what do you think? So Allah is not saying, okay, for all these big decisions in your life, moving house, um, uh, uh, you know, changing your career, all these kind of things. Do you have to consult your children or get your children's opinion on if they're just five years old or six years old or seven years old? But when they do become their own person and they are their own man, this is the time to really engage them into their own critical thinking, ask them for their opinions, see what they think about these kind of situations. And when is the last time that we've really thought of our children on that level where we have a big decision to make and we're ready to ask them their opinion about these things? Sometimes we don't do that. And unfortunately, when we don't, then um, we're not setting up this model for our children to really have periods that are, of critical thinking when it comes to big decisions. And sometimes we don't set up that model for them to come back to us when they have big things going on in their life. Uh, they, 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 they don't have that model to, to be able to think, I should go back to my dad or my mom and, and ask them what they think about these situations. So this is, again, another point here that Allah shows how Ibrahim wants to get his son involved and so he asks him his opinion. Then to sort of round this off, um, Ismail models his father and he addresses him and he says, Ya Abati. So you see before Ibrahim the father came and used some endearing words and terms to address his son. And now his son has sort of reciprocated that and mirrored that back because he's seen the type of manners. He's seen the, the, the way that he should be speaking to his father. He's seen that from his own dad. And so now he reciprocates that same uh, uh, mannerisms uh, back to his father. And he says, oh, my dear father. And then obviously this ends with Ismail alayhi salam saying that do what you need to do. You'll find me steadfast. You'll find me willing. 
insha'Allah. And this shows us how much trust Ismail السلام, has with his father. And the way that this trust was built up was because Ibrahim السلام, of course, number one, he's a prophet. And number two, Ismail السلام, has a high level of taqwa being a prophet himself. But um, we need to also realize that the tarbiyah that the father would have shown the son, the amount of involvement the father would have had with the son, in the son's life would have built that trust, would have built that bond so that Ismail uh, salam can come and say, okay, no problem. I trust what you're doing. You're a prophet of God and you know, you're know you my father. You've never let me down. You are a wise person. So let's go ahead and do what needs to be done. So these are a few lessons that we learned from this ayah. Um, Another story that we can look at when it comes to the power of an involved father is the story of Yaqub and Yusuf alayhi salam. So it starts off in Surah Yusuf, the very famous uh, surah uh, that covers the whole story of the Prophet Yusuf. It starts with him coming to his father and again using that same terminology that we see, Ya Abati, using the most endearing words to speak to his father. And he comes and he tells him of this dream. Now, this is the first indication is that the son was ready to tell his father about a dream that he's had, meaning that he's already got a good relationship with his father, meaning that he already trusts his father and he already has this bond. And the reason this is quite stark is because we can see that the other brothers didn't have this relationship with their father and the other brothers, maybe if they were in this situation, they wouldn't have... Uh, being able to be that open with their father and tell them that we've had this dream. But it's it's clear that, um, you know, Yusuf السلام, has got that because of the bond that he has with his father. Um, then we see how does um, the father then respond? How does uh, Yaqub respond? Again, you see the same terminology. Ya bunay. Okay. Oh, my dear son. Again, using that kind of endearing language. And then he tells him about uh, protecting his vision or not relaying his dreams to his brothers because they may devise a plot, a plot against him. Now, why is this an important point to bring up when it comes to an involved father? Because the father here knows all of the personalities of his sons. He knows how Yusuf is and he knows how Yusuf's brothers are. That's the only way that he was able to uh, know um, other than wahi from Allah and other than knowledge from Allah, he was able to then know what could possibly happen, what could go wrong, because he knows that his brothers are mischief makers, they, they have some jealousy, they're the type of personality that they maybe, you know, they don't know, they don't like Yusuf. How would the father have known that dynamic between the brothers, other than if he was actually involved in their lives and he could see them, he could interact with them and he knew their personalities. And so because of that, he was able to then save Yusuf السلام, from maybe something that could have uh, gone wrong. But of course, we know what happened in the story. Then uh, finally, what does uh, the father Yaqub here do? Is that he he notices that Yusuf السلام, is coming to him worried in this dream, right? When he's relaying this dream, he's a bit worried. What happened? Why did I see this? And now you're also telling me that my brothers may plot against me. So what advice does he round this off as the father? He tells them that your Lord has chosen you. Okay, That he has chosen you, okay, um, to teach you all of these things. Essentially telling Yusuf السلام, that he's from this lineage of prophets now. He's from this, uh, he's now part of this, uh, uh, mission of prophethood right so he gives him he sort of uh, um, uh, quells his worries and he sort of gives him this uh, aspect of motivation and this confidence they say look don't worry about uh, the potential uh, harms that may come this is a good sign from Allah this dream that you've had it means that you're going to be protected you're going to be on the path of the prophet Allah has chosen you specifically so it shows how the father has concern for his child. And when his child comes to me with worries, he actually goes out of his way to console him, giving some practical advice, like don't relay your uh, dreams to your brothers. And then also gives him confidence and motivation by telling him, look, you're going, you're going to be all right. You're going to be from this kind of 
mission of the prophets, inshallah. So these are two stories that I wanted to bring um, to everybody uh, from the Quran. And I think we said we'll do some questions at the end. So inshallah, I'll carry on um, to the second part now. So the second part of this is looking at the negative impact uh, that an absent father can have on children. And I've pulled um, some statistics from the National Fatherhood Initiative, which is based in uh, America, and they uh, have various different studies uh, that they have compiled on um, families and uh, different sort of uh, dynamics within families. And so I've pulled out the ones uh, on the negative impact of an absent father on children. I think it's just important for us to know this um, because inshallah, many of you that are here, you've signed up to something like this because you want to be involved in your children's life and you want to take that extra step to learn from uh, the, the material that's in this course uh, to improve your, your relationship with your children. Um, and this is just something that gives you an initial uh, uh, sort of a, a look into what could possibly happen if you didn't take that step or you weren't involved in your in your child's life and maybe you know people as well who um don't have uh, uh, are, are not involved in the in the child's life and what are the potential impacts that can happen now of course there are anomalies here right um in the sense that you're going to find that many people from a single parent household haven't fallen into the typical consequences that come out in some of these studies and of course that can happen to Allah's dua through the um the 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 kind of hard work of the parents of the mother or the father whoever is the primary caregiver because of of their tenacity and and their their sort of motivation and the work that they're putting in and Allah's help that it means that this doesn't happen but what i want to present are the general statistics of the trends and the patterns that we see and so this isn't to sort of uh, sideline anybody's effort or to make anybody feel like if they're from a particular uh, family dynamic that this definitely applies to them no it may be that you you are not part of those same statistics and uh, this is just some general information for you to know so one is uh, from the angle of school and academic performance so children living in a father absent homes are more likely to repeat a grade in school so, for example, this study that was done by the U.S. Department of Education found that children living in father absent homes were twice as likely to repeat a grade as children living in two parent homes. And so, you know, the the uh, opposite to that that's in this picture, which is the father involvement in schools is associated with the higher likelihood of student mostly getting AIDS. So that's sort of the correlation that we see that less father involvement means likely to have lower grades and more father involvement means likely to have better grades when looking at mental health children living in father absent homes are more likely to have anxiety and depression for example a study um, that was done in 2011 found that children living in father absent homes were more likely to report symptoms of anxiety and depression than living in two parent homes right um, and then the opposite to that being on the picture, that children who have involved dads are less likely to be mistreated. So again, here, when looking from a mental health perspective, that the less access to the father or the father not being as involved in the home can lead to spikes in uh, mental health difficulties. And those who are involved means that children are more resilient, more stronger, less likely to be bullied or mistreated um, in, in school. Then we're looking at the aspect of sexual behavior. Children living in father absent homes are more likely to have sexual problems. For example, a study by Ellis and Garber in 2000 found that girls who lived in father absent homes were more likely to engage in early sexual activity and to have multiple sexual partners than girls who lived in two parent homes. Um, and then again, looking at the opposite here on the picture, that daughters are less likely to uh, engage in this risky behavior when they have a sense of closeness with their fathers. So the father being around in the household and giving that sort of uh, protective uh, um, closeness towards their daughters allows the daughters to be less promiscuous or, or it means that they have less opportunities to do that whereas those who don't have the father present they may be exposed to certain situations uh, that they would have been uh, more likely protected from if the father was in the household 
Then lastly, you have uh, the negative effects of delinquent, delinquent behavior. So children living in father absent homes more likely to engage in delinquent behavior. For example, a study uh, that was done in 1994 found that children living in father absent homes were more likely to be arrested for a crime than living in two parent homes. Uh, and it shows here that individuals from father absent homes are 279% more likely to carry guns. Uh, this obviously in America deal drugs than peers living with their fathers. Um, so yes, of course, here we're seeing that the lack of the father figure may mean that children are more exposed to these types of lifestyles and indulge in them more. Now, like I said at the beginning, there's obviously many other factors to take in, uh, in, in consideration here before we apply this to your own particular situation. There are sometimes situations where families are split apart um, for purposes, for uh, and it may be even that it's actually better for the children, for the mother and the father, that this family is slightly broken apart and people live separately because there are there there are situations which are toxic. There are situations where even she have have advised that maybe you should live apart or else you know being together can make things difficult. So that's not looking at those specific situations. This is talking from a general uh, point of view to give you some of the um, potential consequences that are patterns that some of these uh, studies have seen. So that's part two on the negative impact and absent, uh, the negative impact that an absent father can have on children. <clears throat> so just wanna move over to our part three, which is our last part um, before we head over inshallah to the question section. So the last part is looking at how can we as fathers ensure that we are then more involved? So we've got evidence from the Quran that being involved is something that is a prophetic tradition and it is something that is encouraged. Then we've seen what could happen if we're not involved as fathers and what are the potential causes of this. So what's the practical solution? What can we do to get more involved? And what I want to present to you here is 11 tips, okay, uh, that I've come up with that I think can work. And all of them, uh, you only need up to 10 minutes to do these things. And you don't need to move things out of the way of your busy schedule that you have as fathers to be able to have this kind of quality time with your children. So let's go through some of them. Toothbrush time. You can gather everybody to brush their teeth simultaneously. And if your children are little, then you transform this in a game where each person dances amusingly while they're brushing, right? So it, I just imagine this is your day, you've got a busy work day, and the only time you really see your children is in the mornings, in the evenings. Here are a few ways in which we can sort of just slip in a little bit of quality time where they feel some closeness to their father. So brushing your teeth, everybody has to brush their teeth in the morning anyway, right? So why not turn that into something where everybody does it together, you turn it into a bit of a game. Number two, breakfast bonding. Here, allocate each child a task for preparing breakfast for in for instance, Aisha could toast the bread while Malik pours the milk and cereal bowls and afterwards everybody gathers around for a device-free meal. So everybody's going to have to have breakfast as well, right? And maybe we can even have a quicker breakfast and get out the door before we need to do the school drop-off and credits need to get to work by everybody sort of sharing in the task. And when everybody has that feeling of responsibility and then they come together around the table, that can bring that closeness. And we obviously make sure parents, there's no devices at the table to make sure that even those five minutes that maybe you're doing a rushed breakfast, there's still some sort of close connection. Three, active family moments. So if you're not hitting the gym, um, you can establish a routine for 10 to 20 minutes home workout with your kids. Older ones can exercise alongside you whilst the younger ones can partake by assisting with, the ti with timers or fetching water. But this is something that I do with my children as well. Um, if I'm not going to the gym on that day, I'll do my workout at home and I'll make sure that I get involved. Either they do some things alongside me or I tell them, no, I can need some water, I'm tired. Or can you press this two minute time? I'm going to do push ups for two minutes or whatever it is. Right. And that, again, brings that closeness. And you're also modeling something good of um, being active in the household. Number four, Quran reading. Engage your children in Quran reading. Let them enjoy, let them join with you with their own mushafs. So if they are at the age that they can read and they read from the same page as you. So this could be that you read ayah by ayah. This could be that um, you read one page, they read one page. Obviously, this depends on how much time you have, but 
every household is inshallah going to have a time that they read quran the parents will make sure they read at least a page of quran in the day the children make sure that they read some sort of quran in the day so why not make that time come together um where you do it together and if they're very young and they're not able to read quran then something i've done with my young children is that um i take their finger instead of using my finger on the mushaf i take their finger and and uh, put it on the line that I'm reading, or I tell them uh, to turn the page for me when I'm done with that page. Um, also, there's like certain apps out there which split each part, um, each part in they they split the Quran into verse by verse, so only one verse comes on the screen. So sometimes what my son does is he gets excited to press the arrow that skips to the next verse and then the next verse. So again, that makes it fun for the children. Five, a thoughtful school drop-off. So skip the radio or anything that you listen to during the school drop-off and stimulate the children's mind with thought-provoking questions tailored to the age and their interests. Um, so these could be uh, instead of just the general questions of how are you or uh, what you're going to be doing today at school, um, this could be bigger questions, uh, you know, uh, around things that you, you really want to learn about your children, you know, who are your friends? um you know uh it could be how does uh how does your teacher teach this particular subject it could be something that requires a longer answer essentially the last few tips here so six insight for school pickups you've got the drop-offs then pickups you know rather than asking the generic how was your day delve into the experiences and inquire about interesting lunchtime events whether they brought a smile to anyone's face or if their friends accomplished their tasks so now you're getting to know your child at a deeper level because it's more school is more than what they actually studied. School is about how they interact with their friends. School is about the types of behavior that they had. You want to find out how good your child was. You There's other ways of finding out rather than saying, was you good, right? Or waiting till parents' evening. It's about inquiring into these little things about who their friends are, what the type of things their friends do, if their friends completed their tasks, if, if you brought a smile to someone's face. Seven, errands and engagement. So involve your kids in daily errands, be it grocery shopping or delivering items to the house. Make them feel important by assigning roles, such as checking, checking off items from a shopping list. Um, so for example, something that my wife does is she's kind of in charge of doing the home delivery of the groceries. Uh, and she kind of gets the kids around the tablet and gets them to choose which things that they want to add to the basket. Um, and they might even have to go look into the fridge and see if we're out of stock of something and then come back and tell her, OK, we need this particular thing. Uh, and again, shopping, grocery shopping, something you have to do. I'm not I'm not picking out anything that is outside your daily schedule. These are things that you're going to have to do anyway. Tidying up together, turn that into a joint effort, assign some tasks and set some collective rewards for finishing within a set time frame. So sometimes you set like a 20 minute timer that my son likes to put on and it's like, okay, you guys have to go clean that room. Me and mom are gonna clean this side. And you know, as if you guys finish everything within that time, then there's a reward. Playtime um, participation. Brother, brother Shabe, could yes. I just make a little comment on? Sure. So your, your point six and seven, I think, the, the, that's they're really important uh, because I, I was reading that with insightful school pickups that when um, when a parent the first time a child sees their parent after school if the the child searches for the parent's eyes you know mm. and uh, I was reading the, the psychologist was saying that don't make it such that your eyes are basically down on your phone at that point you know at that moment, when they're just looking to connect, make sure that you greet them with your full attention. You know, I thought that was quite powerful because um, I think the tendency is there, isn't it? To be like looking down at your phone as you're going to pick them up and always in a rush sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and the, the one that you said about errands, um, I noticed that as children got a bit older, um, we started just leaving them at home and one of us will go mm. and do the errands, you know, rather than involving them with us. Mm. So we had to, we, we, we actually had a chat and said, no, we should be taking them with us so that they actually learn through that journey, through that experience, how to interact with people or whatever it is that we're doing. So, yeah, I think um, because it's so easy to not involve them, I think those, those two points are very important. 
Jazakallah khairan. No, Jazakallah khairan. That, that is really good. Um, yeah, I think that's quite important. Like even certain errands, like you're dropping something off to a friend's house. Like, you know, you might cook something and think I'm going to drop it off somewhere. Um, bring your children with you. Let them see that you've actually gone through the effort of bringing food to somebody's house. And that's a good thing to do. Um, so, yeah, many of these things are, are really important. Jazakallah khairan for those extra points, um, looking into the child's eyes and picking them up and, and things like this. Um, so we have playtime participation. So instead of scrolling your phone during your breaks, invest 10 minutes into your children's activities. So um, you may be, uh, I mean, this maybe applies more so to um, uh, a parent that works from home. Okay. Um, and sometimes you'll take a break and your break will be just checking your phone and your messages and scrolling through something. Um, or it may be even after you've come back from work, you work in the office and you want to relax. Yeah, take your time to relax. But what you could also do is consciously say, okay, for 10 minutes, uh, I'm my children are coloring something or they're playing a video game or they're doing whatever they're doing, right? Depending on their age. I'm going to take part in that for 10 minutes, whether that be me physically actually taking part or just being next to them whilst they're doing their activity. 10 is dinner unity. Uh, so like the breakfast routine, very similar to that. Give everybody um, responsibility, gather everybody around and make sure that there's no devices at the table. Again, you have to eat dinner. Why not just do that together? And the last one, bedtime comfort. Be present during those final moments before your children fall asleep. This offers them a sense of security as one day ends uh, and another one begins. So the first thing that they get, the, the last thing that they see when the day ends is you and your face and they hear your words. And then the, hopefully the first thing when they wake up is you maybe waking them up or you getting them involved in the breakfast routine or the teeth brushing and, and whatnot right so hopefully you're starting and ending the day in those ways so these kind of 11 points are all points that take less than a few minutes or they don't take any time out of your schedule they're actually within the things that you're doing during the day it's just about fine-tuning those moments to ensure that there is some quality time there sometimes when we think of quality time we think we have to book a thousand pound holiday we have to uh, take out a whole weekend we have to go on a trip we have to do all those kind of things those things are kind of you know the icing on the cake those things can't happen all the time and when they do happen okay that's great but what about all you know the other times right are you always going to wait for the end of the year to take them on a holiday and that's your quality time what about daily building that bond slowly and slowly through these particular things i think those are really important um so that was the third part I have a, a quick activity, um, but I feel like we might go over time. So maybe it's better we just kind of take questions um, from now. Um, so maybe if we have time at the end, we'll go back to the activity. So the last thing I'll just say is um, a little bit about myself and dadhood. Um, so like I mentioned, it is a podcast that is related to Muslim fathers. Um, and the idea was, you know, it kind of started off where when my wife was first pregnant, I was kind of frantically searching online, looking for experiences of Muslim, Muslim fathers, whether that was a video, a podcast, an article, anything like that. And all I could come across were dads were not Muslim, dads were from outside of the culture, which were great because obviously fatherhood kind of has a universal, parenting is, is quite universal, but there's certain things that we want to get from our own experience within our religion, our community and our culture. And I wasn't really finding that. So, you know, I decided when my son turned about two or three, I was like, okay, let me kind of start this up. Um, and alhamdulillah, it's been going well. Um, so all I ask you guys to do is to inshallah support that. Um, uh, so we have two ways of supporting that. One is by subscribing to the YouTube channel, which says up here, dadhood, just search on YouTube. And the other way is subscribing to our newsletter uh, where I send out some of these tips. So some of the things you've seen here already, which is delving into the ayahs, uh, going into some practical tips, looking at some statistics. Uh, I create a lot of newsletters around these things. So the link is there. You might just need to physically type it in. Um, it's not too long. And inshallah, subscribe to those two things. So yeah, we'll take some questions. And if we have any time at the end, I can go over to the little task that I had, inshallah. Sure, that's great. Okay, Bismillah. So if anybody has a question, um, we we'll encourage you to speak, to unmute yourself. Um, but if you don't want to, then I'm sure we can just put it in the chat. 
Okay, I've just seen this one. Um, yeah, Shall I read it? Okay, so Brother Ghazi says, Inshallah, our children are not part of those statistics. It's very scary to hear all this, but again, Allah is greater than all these patterns and statistics. So how does a father who doesn't live under the same roof as his children be there for them in terms of all these activities listed? Uh, inshallah, yes. Um, make dua, Allah SWT protects all of us from any of these harms. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a difficult one in terms of you know, the father doesn't live under the same roof because he may have a strong desire and a strong need to be close to his children, to build a bond with his children. But the situation is such that he doesn't live in that same household. Maybe the parents are split apart for whatever reasons. Um, the first thing, of course, is uh, dua, okay? Um, making that dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, reaching out to him and making sure that that constant connection to your children is through Allah. So if you don't have a chance to be with them, that you can you can tell Allah how you feel about that, how you um how much you want to be with your children. And you hope that Allah actually rewards you for those moments, that you intend to be with your child, you intend to give your child that closeness and that bond. Uh, and Allah SWT looks at that and says, my slave intends to do this, but he can't do this. And, and there's no way that he can do this because of what the situation is, but he has a strong intention. Therefore, I can reward him uh, for this. So that's that's one thing, inshallah. Uh, the other thing being uh, to increase one's righteousness. We see in Surah Al-Kahf that uh, Allah SWT tells us um, why uh, Khidr, he, uh, uh, he, 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 uh, built up that the wall and hid that treasure um, that was for the the orphans, uh, and and why that treasure was left um, was because uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells us that <clears throat> their father was righteous, so they he that the father even from a distant distance, uh, you know, already being passed away. Okay, these two were orphans. Even from that distance. Uh, because of his righteousness, he was still benefiting his children, right? Um, so, of course, building up your own righteousness and having that is something that can help. Then, okay, these are some maybe uh, spiritual things. What about the more practical things? Um, I would say that any opportunities that you do get to interact with your children, that uh, you make the most of that time and you don't uh, allow any baggage that may be coming along with the situation that you have with their mother, allow that to get in the way. Uh, and I'm kind of speaking from slight, some sort of personal experience. So not in your shoes, but the shoes of the child. So I didn't grow up with my father. And uh, the first time I did get a chance to interact with him, unfortunately, there was a lot of that baggage that was put forward about uh, my mother and sort of bringing my mother into those conversations. And that meant that I didn't really get to connect with him <clears throat> as my father. And I didn't get to kind of see him in the best light because of that. And that was my first interaction, which would, which then kind of shaped my image of what my future interactions with him will be. Um, and I, obviously I'm, I'm not saying that you're going to do this. It's just from my own personal experience, it's important to point out that those small interactions that you do have, they're going to maybe in the child's mind paint uh, your character as a whole. Now, of course, from the child, as he matures, he'll be able to understand that, inshallah, he'll be able to understand that there's multiple uh, facets to a human being and that one interaction doesn't paint the whole hu human being as one thing. And I had to learn that later after I properly reconnected with my father. Um, going back to the question again, how does a father who doesn't live on the same roof be there? Um yeah, I would just say from my, it's it's hard to answer it from, from that perspective and just looking from my own personal perspective of not having my father around and and how that felt to me. Um, I, I would have appreciated, for example, if my father would have uh, reached out every so often to let us know uh, that he was thinking of us. So if he couldn't physically be there with us, if there's a way to get a message, a phone call, a letter, anything like that, that would have been greatly appreciated, okay, from a distance, because the child sometimes, like I did for a long time, think um, if there's no contact coming through, it's because he doesn't think about us, 
of course, I was very, very wrong. Once I reconnected with my father, um, there were reasons why he couldn't contact. Um, but if there were, if that contact is able to come through, that would be very, very helpful and powerful because it would sort of stop um, the distance from becoming too distant. Even though you can't be there, it will still feel like, okay, my father's thinking about he about me and he wants to be close to me. If there's a possibility of sending gifts over, that would be excellent as well. Okay, I know sometimes in these situations in uh, divorce or whatever the case is, uh, that sometimes contact is very limited. But if there's a way of sending a gift, if you can't obviously have the address of the household, but you can send it to maybe somebody else that can get it over to the children, uh, that will be, I think, greatly appreciated as well. Um, and and yeah, if uh, if you're able to get to a point where you can have some more time with the children uh, uh, make that that time really really valuable um, and really make them feel like all that time that's being spent all that energy that money whatever you're doing with them in that time is for them is for this bond and it's for no other purpose and there's no other strings attached it's not because I'm trying to make myself seem better so I can get more custody or something like this it's not because I want uh, to show off in any way um, to to the the ex-partner or whatever it is it, it, there's a pure genuine thing that I'm here for my children I just want to build that bond so I guess those are a few things just from my own personal experience of being on the other end and being the child uh, hopefully that helps Yes, Jazakallah khairan. Um, could, I'll just make a little comment about that as well, uh, to just um, in addition to what Brother Shaib said. I'd say it really shows you the um, importance of, of having an amicable relationship with your ex, you know? Like, whatever the situation is at the moment, I would say, or, you know, however the situation was left, I think it's in the interest of both mother and father and the children that uh, the spouses, the ex-spouses, at least going forward, make a plan to kind of work out their differences or put them aside for the benefit of the children. You know, even if that means putting your egos aside a bit, if that means sacrificing a bit of ego, in order to just be able to have more time, more kind of access to the children, etc. Even if the other party is being unfair, right? And we can't really control their actions. I would say it's really important to have a plan and uh, make a concerted effort to rebuild the relationship, at least to the point where the children can be minimally affected. You know, um, I think it really shows that. And also, I would say, probably, don't you think, Brother Shaib, it would be good in situations like that if if a father can have one-to-one -one time with each of their ch children separately, you know, um, not just always together, but also separately, because I think children, when they're by themselves, have different have a different response and interaction, don't they? They relate differently to their parents than when they're all together. So I think sometimes trying to yeah. build that in is gonna be important as well. Jazakallah khairan. Let me read the next question we've got here. Uh, now a lot of women are working mothers. How can we portray the importance of father's presence for the family apart from only financial, mm. financial means? How can we help them and encourage them to take more roles within family life. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, I have a few points on this one. So uh, one thing is, you know, to remember that fathers having uh, maybe more involvement nowadays, which is a great thing, um, from the communities that many of us have come from, OK, uh, and the previous generations where those cultures are, that type of involvement wasn't always there. That doesn't mean that that was right and this is wrong. I'm just saying from the hard facts that we have is that now there's a trend of fathers being more involved and before that trend wasn't there. Whereas for mothers, the trend has always been that you are kind of going to be the primary caregiver and you're going to be involved in the child's life. 
which means then that the generational knowledge that is being passed down to mothers is quite strong. And that usually, not in all cases, but usually a female grows up knowing that this is going to be an important part of her of her life and her role and that she's maybe seen from grandmothers and mothers and aunties what they do with their children whereas a young boy and a young man for generations that kind of knowledge hasn't really been passed down the knowledge that has been passed down is protect your family and go and earn and these kind of things which are important but being more involved beyond that within the child's life Sometimes that isn't passed down. And so we. this is not to make an excuse, but it's just to kind of put it into context, is uh, not to kind of um, uh, make fathers feel like they are uh, doing something completely wrong when many of these fathers maybe are not used to uh, or don't even see uh, how a father can mold himself within that sort of dynamic can be maybe more involved so I guess it's more less about blaming the dads and more about helping them uh, to step up I'm not saying that the, whoever asked was was blaming but this is just kind of uh, a general note is that we should maybe help the fathers step up rather than blaming them because that generational knowledge hasn't really been passed down that's one point another point is that um the aspect of a father okay uh his fatherhood is more than just the changing of the nappies. Now, I'm going to caveat that and say that I actually believe the changing of the nappies is really important. Okay, and I'll come back to that. But uh, I want to give this point first, which is <clears throat> it's more than the changing of the nappies and it's more than the than being really close with the children and doing maybe the things that are seem to be more feminine or seem to be more motherly. Because included in the father's role is that the child gets to see that he goes out to work the child gets to see that he's involved in his community the child gets to see that he prays his salah in the masjid the child gets to see that he uh, uh, takes other responsibilities outside of his family maybe within his community maybe within the ummah he does all of these things he he seeks knowledge he he gets fit he goes to the gym all of these things are very important for the child to look up to the father and see that this also makes up a father, that he does all of these types of things. Mm -hmm. And that adds to the experience of the child and how he how he looks at his father. So sometimes if we see a father that doesn't do maybe the more motherly things, we think that father's not involved. But actually, by the father doing all those other things, he may be setting up a very good example for his children and a very a being a very good role model. And maybe we're dismissing that because we have uh, we're, we're surrounded by maybe certain ideologies that are pushing a certain way that a man mm. should be. Um, so that's that's kind of a second point I want to make. And then the final point is just to go back to the change in the nappies is that, yes, I do think that the father taking on more of these may be what is considered to be more motherly. I think that they should still do some of those things. Um, for example, even from the point of when the baby's in the womb, the father should be speaking. The father should be reciting Quran, getting his voice familiar with the child. When the child is being born, the father should be there right i think anyway i'm not saying this is a must or this is if the father's not there in in the room in the labor room that, that he's wrong but from my own perspective i think that that is important that he is there he is there within the he's taking that paternity leave away from work he's helping with changing uh the nappies he's there burping the baby all these kind of more infant things that are seen to be more motherly i don't say the mother shouldn't do it and the father should only do it. i think uh, and i still think the mother should do, probably do it more but I think the father should still get involved in that whole process because it will definitely build the bond. And I think it will allow the father to uh, have that more compassion that we see from some of these fathers, these prophets, like Yaqub, like Ibrahim, like Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It allows him to build that compassion for children when he's involved from a young age. And that compassion is obviously very important for a father to have. Uh, yeah, those are some of my points. I think that the, the main question was, how do we get them more involved? I think just knowing some, some of what I've said uh, puts things into more context. And then getting them more involved is maybe just giving them, allowing them to have those opportunities in case you're depriving those opportunities. I've seen, for example, some mothers be very afraid to allow the man in the household to take the child out for the day or to or to feed their child or to change their child and they have their own anxiety maybe the mother does 
But, you know, and the man's a man. Let him, you know, uh, do what he needs to do. If he's getting it a bit wrong. Yeah, his way. Yeah. Yeah. Let him do yeah. it his way. And uh, it might be uh, beneficial for the child to do it in that way rather than your way. Uh, so allow those opportunities to be there. And like like I said, yeah, maybe even if the father's still reluctant, maybe reiterate some of the points that we've learned in the presentation of the importance of being involved. Yeah, and I think mothers can play a big uh, role in drawing their children's attention to what fathers do, you know, because uh, one of part of the question was, you know, how can we portray the importance of father's presence for the family? I, I think the idea was, you know, is it that sometimes um, it's only financial that people think of fathers, you know, in, in that regard. But I think as mothers, what we can do is we can draw our children's attention to the things that the father does that maybe they're not getting to see you know so they don't just think oh mom's doing everything you know um i think a lot of the things that fathers do are hidden things um, and that's why you know people when they when they lose their fathers for example um when they if they're orphaned or even later in life if if a father passes away one of the things because consistent things you hear people say is i felt like uh like this safety net was removed you know I felt like this uh, I was under the shade of something and that shade was removed and I think that's because there's like this in the invisible stuff that dads do right um uh that if it wasn't for them we wouldn't you know for example if it wasn't for dad it, you know I wouldn't be able to relax and sit here with you you know um it's because dad does his work that we can do these things we can buy these things we can uh, function in this way, et cetera, et cetera. I think, I think it's important for each parent to highlight the contribution that the other is making so that children can um, appreciate it more. I actually have one more question that somebody sent to me uh, over WhatsApp um, from our group. And... The sister is saying, um, is it possible that the absence of a father can be better for the children if, if the father has certain, you know, behaviors or certain suffers from certain illnesses and the mother is afraid that, you know, some kind of harm may come to the child? I think. Uh, this is from a sister who who is no longer living with her husband. So she's asking, isn't it possible that the absence of a father can be better for for children? Okay, so it's a good question. Um, right, in very there may be very very extreme cases, right, where it's not necessarily even about the father being the father. It's about there's a human being in the dynamic that doesn't have the correct mental health or doesn't have the correct facilities okay to be able to take care of children or to be able to take care of other people within the family right removing the father from it it could have been any human being in that position uh it it for, just from a logical perspective it would make sense that um that situation maybe that person who has those difficulties and maybe is being very toxic to the other members of the family that that person may be removed or there may be a situation where that person needs to temporarily be removed to receive help and then be allowed back to the family unit um, all of these kind of things so of course there are going to be those situation and situations and we shouldn't <clears throat> try and pinpoint it down to the fact of him being a dad and having those things it's just anybody could have had those things and it could really affect uh, the family. So I think, yes, there are extreme cases where if somebody in the family has those type of problems, depending on the advice that you get from your local scholars, depending on the advice that you get from um, family counselors and, and whoever else is uh, uh, social workers, whoever else is helping the situation, it may be that your situation requires for that temporary breakup to happen in order to bring things back to normality. Um, but then we also need to think from the angle of is is this from a logical perspective or is this being taken as an emotional burden, right? Is maybe the mother in the situation 
looking at it from her lens and that she feels very scared about the situation because mm. maybe she has a right to feel scared. Maybe there is uh, something that has gone on between her and, and her husband that gives her the right to feel afraid uh, of him being uh, being in her life. But then is she then projecting that onto her children? Is she uh, exactly. allowing her own burdens and, and allowing her children to take on her own burden as their own, right? It could be that the father... Um, uh, whoever is in the situation has harmed one member of the family, but has never harmed anybody else and has no intention of harming anybody else. Should those other people also take on the burden of that one person and and paint their relationship with that with the father through the lens mm. of that one person who's been burdened? I don't think that would be correct to do. Even if you look at it from outside of a family perspective, you look at it from maybe a group of friends, would that be correct for that to happen? If you look at it from any other sort of societal group, uh, I don't mm. think anybody will conclude and say, yeah, it's okay for me who hasn't been hurt by this person to treat this person as if they they have hurt me. Um, so I think, you know, I'm not saying this is a situation, but look into it and see whether it's maybe the mother projecting these type of things uh, on. Um, and then, uh, then the other thing to think about is also the age of the children, okay? Of course, when they're very, very young, uh, it may be different. It may be that uh, the type of access is less so, okay? It doesn't mean there should be no access, but it might mean that it's less so. Now, as your children get older and they become their own people, okay, and they, they're getting into sort of adulthood, they shouldn't be prevented by any member of the family to see any other member of the family, there's a, this, okay, depending, regard, okay, unless it's a very specific situation, situation the sheikh is given a fatwa, from a general perspective, this will actually be haram. For you to prevent somebody from reaching out to their own family members would actually be haram. So unless there's a specific fatwa in a specific situation, I would be very careful to, to uh, prevent the older children from reaching out to the father. No matter what the father's done, no matter what his mental health state is, whatever's happening, that child, they should obviously, that child, if I'm speaking to that child themselves, they should take their own precautions, right? Um, but uh, they shouldn't be prevented by anybody else to go ahead and do that if that's what they want to do. And as long as they've, they've taken the precautions that need to be taken to make sure that that conversation, that relationship that they're going to have now is going to be as safe as possible for them. Yeah. And also I'd be careful when it comes to getting fatwas as well, because I actually find it quite upsetting that some shayukh are willing to sit there with one party mm -hmm. and take their entire story and then give a conclusion you know which now that per that party could basically use you know <laughs> they might even end up weaponizing that against the other party yeah um i think it's very problematic because you know it's so easy for one side of the story to just seem make the story seem so so black and white right so i think anytime you're going to refer to shiur it's always good to be willing to do it properly like as a mediation session almost like with with your spouse or your ex spouse you know so that both sides of the story can be uh put forward uh, i think it's very problematic when it's just one person's uh, perspective that's taken in by a sheikh and then so there's that but the other thing as you said uh brother shaib um i think moms have to be really careful that you know something that you consider to be making your children safer you could be harming them in 10 other ways you know mm -hmm. because you think you're you, you're making them safer from one thing right so as much as possible and with keeping whatever precautions you think are absolutely necessary, if that relationship and whatever is good in that relationship can be maintained, I think it's in your interest as a mother because one day those kids are going to grow up, you're going to have to handle whatever they come with, right? Um, it's in your interest that they grow up with their dad even with the flaws that the dad has, you know, um, nobody's dad is unflawed. Even those of us who grew up with our dads, um, you know, nobody's dad is unflawed. Everyone has their issues or traumas and things that they, they, they're carrying and they pass down and, you know, but 
but I think it's in that in those flaws, there's a beauty as well, right? There's a hum humanness that children mm -hmm. have to learn about. You know, there's human beings out there that are flawed that we we still love. Um, so I, I think mothers should be really careful to do, you know, minimum necessary changes, like if it, and not to sort of um, not to go ballistic, basically, and not not do anything that's like an ultimatum or anything that's final. Because don't you think, Brother Shay, maybe you can speak to this based on your experience as well. Um, mm -hmm. A child wants a happy story for their life, you know? Like, when they're thinking about who I am, they want the narrative of their life to be something positive. Yeah. And sometimes the adults um, make it more negative than it needs to be, right? Mm. And so I think it's really important to help your children to frame whatever their father's going through whatever the whatever this situation is that you're going through to mm. frame it in the best way possible and in a way that they have hope for the future you know they have a positive hope for the future um because sometimes something that you consider to be really bad that the father does uh, i'm not saying all the time but you know it, it is possible that something that from from your eyes and your perspective looks very harsh very the child is not really experiencing it that way, you know, sometimes. So you've got to be really careful. Um, and, and how many children say, you know, um, I'd rather have had my dad in my life, even mm. with his flaws, even with his flaws. Uh, I don't know if you want to uh, say anything about yeah. that. Um, you know, subhanAllah, the, the point that you brought up about uh, the, f the flaws of, of, of the father and no, nobody's perfect. Uh, me, I, I always had this perception that, the, um, you know, that the father has to be without flaws and, and that if he has those flaws, that's, that's what, that's what's making this so difficult. That's why he's, he's separated. That's why I can't get in touch with him. That's why all of all of these problems uh, are occurring and so you sort of build up this um resentment towards your father because he's not living up to the standard that you have set the expectation that you've set and once I kind of reconnected with him and I had a chance to get to know him and I realized that he's just as much as a flawed human being as as I am and everybody else is it makes it much more easier for me to remove that resentment and have mm. forgiveness for him. Because if that was me, I I know myself and I would have hoped that somebody would have looked at me and said, those flaws that I have doesn't make up my whole character. Doesn't make me who I am as a whole. I've just made mm. a few mistakes here. Maybe I've made major mistakes as well, but still, um, I, I, I that doesn't paint me uh, completely. And that's not accurate representation of myself to judge me through those flaws. I I have flaws and everybody else has flaws. And so when you think about it like that, and it makes it much more easier for you to have that forgiveness and for you to actually feel that level of closeness uh, with your father that you thought you wouldn't have ever had. So in this situation with the sister, um, I think it's important that the children do get to see the father with those flaws because as long as those children are maybe at a mature age, okay, when when I was young guys, when I had those expectations that things should be perfect, it's only when I got older and I had my own children, I realized that actually there's more, there's more to human beings than there is these standards and expectations that we set. So if those mm. children are older and they have that level of maturity, that I think it would be yeah. important to allow the child to see uh, the father, even if you think he's flawed or harmful and whatnot, because it that may be the very thing that breaks that child's uh, barriers that he or she has put up and allows them to connect with their father in a way that they thought they would have never connected before. Yeah, absolutely. As long as you can make the situation safe. Yeah. You know, um, and there's multiple ways that I'm sure you could figure out to do that. Um, I think just having dad in your life, it adds a layer of, to your identity, you know, that, yeah. I don't think you can ever put a value to and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So I think 
pretty much those are the questions. Um, okay. If you wanted to do the final little session, it's up to you. Um, I know we have uh, technically finished <laughs> time-wise, uh, but we still got uh, a number of our parents online. And uh, how long do you think uh, we can we can do it for five minutes if people want to. Um, yeah, bit, you, you've made us so curious well. now. Like, I think <laughs> you have to ignore my thousands of tabs, please. I'm one of those people. Um, okay, so I wanted to quickly put this together as like a way of fathers sort of being able to segment their day, uh, even mothers as well. And just as a quick tip for parents who are very very busy on how they can sort of look at a busy week and say, okay, how do I get on top of everything? And I wanted everybody to participate. So on the yellow sort of sticky notes that you can see here, are all the tasks that you have maybe going on <clears throat> in a week. <laughs> and the four boxes here are areas in which we need to move these yellow sticky notes into. So the do now box is considered important urgent. So we have urgent, not urgent at the top, important, not important on the side. So one box, which is and task which is urgent and needs to be done, and it's important as well. That means we must do it now. Then we have the schedule for later box, which is, this is an important task, but it doesn't have to be done right now. We schedule it for later. Then we have the not important, okay? Um, uh, but it is urgent. That means we can delegate it. And then we have the last box, which is, it's not important, it's not urgent for this week. Then let's eliminate it for now. Um, so if everybody can help me, <clears throat> let's go for the first one, chai with friends, where would everybody put it? You, I guess the easiest thing is just to go in the chat box and say, do now, schedule later, delegate or eliminate. Those are your four options. Miss you, you need to have chai with friends. I've seen your task list for this week. Where would you put it? <clears throat> you know, sometimes uh, I think it's urgent and important. <laughs> To have, chai, <laughs> to have chai with friends because you really need a break you know it might be yeah so Misha's schedule for later sorry mm -hmm. I, I won't read out name sorry yeah but you have to decide if it's important and if it's urgent and where it then goes okay we've got two things scheduled for later so we'll overrule you of Sheikha and we'll put it here okay not urgent, could be urgent when you have problems. Important, not urgent, schedule for later. Okay, most people are saying schedule for later. All right, let's go for date night with the wife or husband, depending on, I think I wrote this from a man's perspective, of course. We'll try and do a few of them. We won't spend too long. Do now. <laughs> schedule for later. Everyone is very chilled out. The context is obviously is that you've got a very busy week and you're trying to prioritize things. So two for schedule for later. Okay, put it in there. Uh, let's go visit sick uncle. Uh, does that mean not this week? No, it would it would mean at some point this week. Eliminate would be you'd not not even do it this week. Uh, do now for sick uncle. No, okay. All right. Uh, let's see what else do we have. Pay a parking fine. I guess this depends on the deadline. You know, I pay par I'm, I pay my parking fines in the car as soon as I get them. <laughs> That's very good. Because if I don't, I know I'll forget and then I'll get that letter, you know. Mm -hmm. That's that's if I think it was a fair parking ticket. <laughs> do now slash delegate to do. Okay. Do now before you forget. So you had, yeah, you had, that's, okay, that's three saying do now. All right, let's put into do now. That's my policy. Do now before. All right, you... Good. Uh, let's say book a family holiday. Schedule for later. Delegate. I think the husbands will say delegate and the <laughs> <laughs> difference of opinion between yeah. schedule for later and delegate. Delegate. There you go. Somebody's. Okay. Okay, let's maybe do one more and then we'll end. Um, which one shall I choose? Let's one say... to one time. One to Sorry? one. One to one time with. One to one time with your son or daughter. Okay, let's go for that one. Do now. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Everyone's saying do now. So everybody on this cohort has got their priorities right, I'm guessing. <laughs> Good, alhamdulillah. Okay, we'll, we'll end it there. I don't want to take too much time. But the, the idea of this is that um, it really helps me and my wife sometimes. We have a really, really busy week. We'll literally get on a whiteboard. We'll put these four um, boxes and we'll um, write down our tasks and then we'll just start putting them into areas in it. Kind of clears your head and makes you feel like, okay, as a busy parent, I have all these things, but I can't actually do them and segment them properly. Yeah, it would be good to do this task with a wife. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, that's that's the idea. Inshallah, do it with your spouse. Just makes things easier. You know what tasks need to be done, who's going to take care of what, when these things get, need to get done now, when they're going to get scheduled later, inshallah. It's just a nice tip, inshallah. Zakala khair. That was a little. Zakala khair. And I, I, you should do a PDF of that and uh, <laughs> let people download it because I think people would download it, print it, and then you know do it with their spouse maybe it's a good idea yeah jazakallah khairan well brother shaib really appreciate your time with us you've given us so much uh so many insights and i love it that you shared also your personal experiences as well so brothers and sisters uh that's the end of today's session thank you so much for participating yes and barakallah fikum as well i'm glad uh you benefited jazakallah khairan brother shaib is there anything you'd like to say right at the end before we end? Yeah, so Jazakallah khair everybody for participating. Really appreciate it. If you guys want to get in touch with me, um, like I said, just search Dadhood on Instagram or YouTube, anything like that. And inshallah, all the links for newsletters and all that will be there. So get in touch if you need anything. Thank you, Brother Shaib. And we have put the some of the links on the WhatsApp group as well. So everyone's got those. Okay, everyone, with that, we will uh, bid you farewell. سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك أشهد أن لا إله إلا أنت أستغفرك وأتوب إليك والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام <تصفيق>